Today, joining us on I Am Pro, we have Katie Ainsworth. Casey is one of the UK's most loved actresses. She trained at the Central School of Speech and Drama. She has appeared in numerous theatre productions and gave an outstanding performance, uh, according to one of Britain's uh, biggest critics, um, as Miss Lovett in Sondheim's Sweeney Todd, and that was at the Everyman in Liverpool. Her CV is longer than my arm, but I think she... Um, well, it's fair to say she captured, captured the nation's heart with her portrayal as Little Mo in EastEnders. Um, as a domestic abuse survivor. She then went on to play um, Kath Keating in Grantchester for 10 years. And like I say, her CV is longer than my arm. She has worked on so many different projects and Casey talks to us today about her experiences as an actress and gives us an insight into her process and just how she creates such memorable and brilliant characters, such as Little Mo. So... Without further ado, here is this month's Q&A. So, Casey Ainsworth, welcome to our I Am Pro Q&A! <laughs> I can't tell you how lovely it is to have you on here with me. How are you? I'm really good and it's so gorgeous to see your face too. Um, it's oh, so it's... lovely. It's been a long time. It's been far too long, but you've been so busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a, it, it, and it still is. It's still at about hundred miles an hour. My um, my my agent likes to say that um, she likes to triple book me, and she has. Well, what a lovely position to be in. Yeah, yeah. It sounds show offy, but it is at the moment. But that's because you know life. It sometimes it goes like that. It's it is. It's like buses, um, as you know. Yeah. You know everything kind kind of comes along at once, and then you have these periods of time where you don't, and that's part of the job. That you know, the, the downtime part of the job. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not showy offy at all. I think we are perfectly within our rights to celebrate and shout about all of our successes. I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. I'll just take you back. So this chat is all about acting and getting like squeezing the juice out of your brain and what you do and how you do it. But first of all, I want to know why acting, Casey? Well, it's as usual, a lot of people, it's by accident. Um, so I accidentally went to an open audition uh, when I was uh, eight or nine because it was round the corner from my dad's office in uh, in Victoria. And my mum said, oh, come on, let's do that. Because, you know, we thought it was half term. <laughs> let's join the queue. Yeah. <laughs> so we literally joined the queue. We didn't have anything else to do. Um, we joined the queue. And I'd already been going to like Saturday morning drama classes, um, which I was really enjoying. And I had to dovetail with my sister. So she got horse riding and I got drama classes. And that was it. Those were the two things that we were allowed to do. And so she had mm. to come to the drama classes, which she hated. And I had to go horse riding, which I, I didn't hate, but I wasn't great at. And uh, so, so it was that kind of thing. So I was already kind of doing a bit of drama just on a Saturday morning, but nothing nothing professional. My parents didn't know anything about stage schools. They didn't know anything. They were just like throwing me into doing something that they thought I might enjoy and might give me confidence. So we yeah. ended up at this open audition for Annie. And um, I mean, this is a really long story, but long story short is after three meetings, I got the, I got the part. I ended up in the West End at the age of nine. And that was my debut in the West End. So, um, and wow. you know, what you want to say is it's all gone up from here, but it's all gone like this from here. <laughs> Which um, is how nobody's it does journey is linear, is it? You know? No, um, not at all. So, but the love for acting started there for you, even though it happened by accident. Yeah, and it's been very interesting. The I've been working with three people recently in a play, and they were all children actors, child actors. Um, and it's really interesting how our love of it grew from that point, um, grew from going to the theatre, maybe seeing pantomime, um, maybe being taken to, or, or watching, you know, somebody you knew in something or do a dance class or whatever. And so my love for it obviously started there. Um, and it's the same with all of these, all these other kids that I've just been working with. Um, they, it's, there's, there's something about it. There's something about the theatre. There's something about being in a theatre when it's empty. Um, mm. and it's just you and you know you're putting on a show and there's nobody in, and you're running around the stalls as kids um, there's something about hearing an orchestra tune up um, there's something about being behind the curtain so so 
you know, waiting for that to, to arrive, but you're behind it, this amazing secret place where everyone's kind of running and trying to find, you know, putting their positions, making sure their props are there, all the rest of it. And it's that. And it was that excitement, I think, that did it. The world that goes on behind the curtain, the play behind the yeah. play is amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, all the when you when it's like when we're in Albert Square and you go behind the flat flat fronts of the of the houses and it's just a it's just a load of you know um, big steels yeah. just holding up these fronts and bits of wood and the occasional cat wandering about somewhere. Not the real one, an actual. Yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? Um, so that moment before you go on stage. How do you handle the nerves of that? Do, can you transfer the excitement, you know, the nerves into excitement? Because um, I feel the fear all of the time. And I just wondered how you manage that and if it's something you experience. Definitely. I don't know anyone who doesn't. Um, but I learned really early on. I did a play, a really beautiful play at the Royal Court with Ray Winston. And it was, I was very young. So I just left drama school and it was a big deal. It was a big deal to get this job. And I put a lot, a lot of pressure on myself. Uh, and one of the actors in it, he's passed away now, is called Terry Beasley. But um, I used to nearly be sick every time I would go on stage. I'd be, I'd have this horrible fear, um, horrible fear inside my body. And um, and he just said to me one day, yeah, you need to do something else with your life. And I was like, what? And he said, you know, if it makes you like this, you don't want to be like this. Do something else. And I thought, I don't want to do anything else. Mm. And, and I said that to him. I said, I, do, I don't want to do anything else. He said, well, then get a handle on this. Get a handle on this emotion. No one's going to die. Nothing Nothing terrible is going to happen. If you fall over, the audience will love it because you're a human being. Yeah. Um, and yeah. from kind of that moment onwards, I thought, what are the nerves about? They're about being perfect or getting it perfect and getting it right. And actually, getting it right is not the most important thing. It's, of course, there is a level of that. Of course, you can't just go on and say what you want. Um, but being perfect means that I don't didn't allow any nuance any change any um any spontaneity any creativity that I wasn't actually then working with the person who was opposite me I'd got a vision of what I wanted the play to look like and how it was going to go on and I was just going to do that and that's not what it's about it's literally about the communication between two people and picking up what's going on with that other person so if that other person falls over you have to react to that if something changes or something happens in the audience you have to kind of react to that by either keeping your concentration wholly on what you're doing but also it's about letting just go of the perfect perfect performance because it doesn't exist and oh once God. I did that I just thought you just have to hold on to what you've done in rehearsal and if you've done enough work in rehearsal and, and then then it's all there anyway. So it doesn't mean that I don't have nerves. I do. Um, but I just take each scene as it goes. So rather than end gaming it, I'll take the first scene, see how, see how that goes, and then go on from there and try not to second guess, I suppose. I can't tell you how amazing that is to hear because I identify with every single thing that you said and it's letting go of that perfectionism, you know, which can consume us. And you said at the beginning there, you know, the amount of pressure that we put on ourselves. Do you think that's quite common in actors? Like, you know, yeah, can we really yeah, I think not, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do to put way too much pressure. Like everything's got to be, you know, yeah. the best. And and some some jobs you learn so many mad things from that are nothing to do mm -hmm. with the acting on stage you know or 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 you learn how not to do something or how you don't want what jobs you don't want to do um and so you mm. regain a little bit of control I think over um your career if you don't hold on to it so tight that everything's got to be absolutely amazing yes you know I you I always give 110 percent and I'm always working hard and it but there's working hard and there's holding on and those are two yeah. different things. Because each yeah, audience is just... different as well. Sometimes you get a laughy, laughy audience. Sometimes you get an audience, the minute you come on, you say your first line, they're laughing and you're going, hey, I'm brilliant. You know? yeah. And then another night you get an audience that's just, just you know, they don't. Silent. They don't laugh. 
they, they, they're quieter, maybe they're listening, maybe they do, you know, they haven't got someone in the audience. I mean, I don't know about you, but I really like to, to have someone on a first night who I know is a laugher. So a mate of mine who I know will just a minute I come on and go, ah, you know, you know, or we'll just, we'll just be, have that energy in the room, you know, and sometimes it's about that too. And also when you've got critics in, of course, they're all sitting there like that going, entertain me, entertain me. So, because they're seeing mm. everything all the time. So you have different energies in the room that you can't control. You can't control any of that. Um, mm. So I think it's really important that you do what you can control only which is which is your participation in the piece and then don't yeah. worry about anything else you can't you can't yeah I definitely um visualize like my daughter being in there or somebody I know and love I hate knowing if anyone else is in you know anyone from the industry or critics yeah. or that's why I can't bear press nights I think a press night should be over the course of a week like a week I think that's what they do in New York because the pressure yeah. of that one night you know yeah it's um, ridiculous but visualizing yeah. Sorry, cut you off. Visualising someone I love being in the audience, sorry, bit of a delay there, um, is really, really helpful for me. I'm blocking everyone else out. Yeah, and there's another thing that I, that I used to do as well. I don't do it so much anymore, but when I became, like, you know, when I put too much pressure on myself, um, my a friend, another actress friend of mine said, hold the gold. Um, and so sometimes if I'm feeling really stressed and pressured... I put a gold cloak on, like visualize a gold cloak. I'm wearing a gold cloak so that before I go yeah. onto the stage, I'm wearing this gold cloak. And if you're feeling ill, wear a green one or a blue one, you know, because they're, they're more kind of uh, calming and protective. But I think sometimes just that energy, just understanding that in your hand you have this piece of gold and it's you. You know, you, yeah. you bring whatever you bring to that part. Whoever played it before, who, if no one's seen it before, whatever, you bring you to that and that's unique and individual. And that's that's all you need to all you need to bring. Yeah. I'm going through something at the moment because I've been I'm in a play that has been going on for quite a while and we've got quite a long time left. And I've never done anything for this long. And uh, the same thing, obviously, EastEnders was a different thing, but um, doing the same thing over and over again. And I was speaking to the director yesterday. I was like, the words are just becoming words. It's like they're all sort of amalgamating into each other. And, and I've forgotten to make sense of them. So even when you get really used to and accustomed to doing something on stage and you can play with it a little bit, there comes a point through the repetition where I've gone, I don't know what it means. <laughs> Have you experienced that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Where it becomes like scrambled egg. Like I know. Like, like you just, you, you, you don't know. Sometimes you don't know if you've done a long run with something. Sometimes you don't know whether you've actually done that scene or not. I mean, and it is a form of torture. It is a, you know, people do repetition as a form of torture. Um, so, you know, it's really hard to keep kind of on the straight and narrow, especially when you have long, a long run in something. Um, I think what I, what I enjoyed when I've done ones that I've enjoyed, and I don't know how long you're on, you're on tour for. Um, but I think the one that I enjoy the, the going to different places so my joy comes out of the going to different places um, and visiting different places wherever you're wherever you're going, um, and the, and obviously the people that you're working with. Um, I did a I did a tour of Calendar Girls um, a long time ago now, nearly ten years ago now, um, and I had such a brilliant and beautiful cast. Um, mm. it, it, and at the head of it was Leslie Joseph and Sue Holdness, and both of them have toured for years and years, been in the business for years and years, constantly, constantly working. And so every every time we went to somewhere, one or other of them would go, right, we're going to this place, we're going to the lace markets yeah. in Nottingham, and then we're going to so-and-so and so-and-so, and then we're having dinner at this place, uh, or afterwards, or before, or whatever. And we'd always have these little these little goals throughout the week so that so that then our heads could somehow relax into something else other than the play. Um, but I, I hear you, it's it's really difficult doing a long a long run. I had a mate of mine who was Jean Valjean for years in, in Limits and I had no idea how we managed to do it every single night. I still don't. Mm. But, you know, it, it, I suppose, yeah, you just, you just take the glory of each, of each performance, but it's really hard. It's really hard. I had a mate who had, who had absences, who started to have absences because she did done two years in the West End playing the same part. And she would forget like, 
big chunks of scenes that she'd done for two years. She would just stand there thinking, I don't know what comes next. So Uh, I think it's breaks are important. But yeah, trying to get your head out of the play as much as possible. And then knowing that, you know, just doing your half, you know. But yeah, pressure, pressure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I've come off stage and gone, I don't know which way I need to go now. Ah! Having done it sort of 170 times so far. (laughs) Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it Um, is terrifying. You went to um, Central School of Dramatic Arts. What was your experience of drama school like? Um, I really enjoyed it and I really needed to go to drama school because I didn't know anybody in the business. And so for me, the the only way of meeting like-minded people was to go to a a drama school. And I knew knew that I only wanted to go to a certain amount, a certain ones. Um, And so I was going to keep going until I got into one of those. Um, just because they were my personal choice, but I was never, I, d- I just didn't have any other way in. I remember going to see my careers advice teacher at, at school and she gave me like leaflets on nursing because how do you become an actor? You know, what do you, what do you, who do you speak to? You know, I, I, there, there was nobody I knew who was an actor and there was nobody, there was people who wanted to dance or wanted to sing or, you know, had lovely voices and all of that kind of stuff. But, but there wasn't anywhere I could be a, a, a anywhere I could, I could go you know you can't phone somebody and go how do you become an actor you can phone someone and say how do you become a plumber or a builder or you know or a surgeon there's a there's a career path but there's no career path in this job there's no ladder there's no there's nothing so so what do you do so my only route in was youth theatre and drama school and so at youth theatre I met people who had applied to drama schools and then I thought well these are the good drama schools because everyone seems to want to go to them and so then I applied so for me it was necessary and I was lucky because there was one grant in Hertfordshire and I got it um and Mm -hmm. then my course changed to a degree course was one of the first courses acting courses that changed to a ba and so i could then apply for a maintenance grant because up to then i was working in fish and chip shops i was packing sausages sunglasses i was doing double jobs ushering you know doing anything in order to kind of maintain myself in london but i don't know how people do it now who haven't got money because there aren't any grants you know yes there's 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 you know you're but you, you know, then you're coming out of drama school with huge amounts of, of, of debt, and also it's so expensive to train in London, um, and that, and that is where the majority of the, you know, there are really good drama schools outside of London, but, but that's where the majority of casting people go, majority of agents go at the end of, of people's, um, you know, training. So yeah, really, really difficult. But I loved it, and I loved it because I was doing it every single day. So every single day I was doing the thing that I loved um, and also learning so much, learning how, because it's a craft. You do have to learn how to use your voice. Otherwise you'll lose your voice. You do have to learn Mm -hmm. how to warm up. You do have to learn all these different methods of acting and which one suits you. You do have to learn different styles, different um, genres, um, you know, what, what you're good at. You do have to test yourself what you're good at, what you're not good at, or what you find easier. Um, you know, or it was a wonderful experience and I really enjoyed it. I had a really good time. Did you, you said you weren't going to stop until you got into one of the ones you wanted. How long did that take? Or did you get in first um, go? So I did, I did the, no, I did the first year and I got recalled and then I got on the wait list uh, for Central. And I think that's probably why I, when I went, when I got in there, because then the following year I got into three different drama schools and, but because I just missed getting into central it was definitely the what place i wanted to go um and so yeah. yeah i got in on my second my second round yeah yeah how how important do you think drama school is for people today well i'm not sure getting- because it's so prohibitively expensive I, I i you know i would say it's really important but if you can't afford it what else do you do and i do think that you can train on the job because I do think there are lots of workshops and classes and things you can join um, and, you know, that you could that you can sign up for. And I think that's really important that you can do it on the job as well. Because most of the time when you go to drama school, really it's a theatrical training you're going to get and a physical and, you know, vocal training you're going to get. You're not going to get a lot of telly. 
So you're going to have to do that on the job or doing things like student films or short films. You're going to have to learn that that way. Um, so there's lots of stuff that you can learn on the job about how to be on screen that you probably won't do a lot of at drama school. Um, mm. I just think what it does is it gives you connections to the business that you might not have. But there's, there is, there's tons. Of, but again, that's the problem as well. There's tons of things you can do outside of a drama school. But are they any good or are you wasting your money? And it's really difficult mm. to tell that. So I think that then you rely on your network of actors, people saying, oh, I, I they, like my director at the moment, he runs a Meisner um, class on a Saturday morning. Um, and I found that really interesting. I'd never done Meisner before. Um, and he, uh, we did it in, as part of our rehearsal process. So now I will probably go to some of his Saturday morning classes because um, I, A, I know he's brilliant and it's good. Um, but, but, I've learned that from him, from kind of within. So yeah, it's about yeah. finding people who you've who you really? who you can work with, or your contemporaries who've been to the places and go, no, this is really good. But li literally yeah. anything you can, anything you do is pretty good, I think, because you're just yeah. doing it. You're just even if it's that. bad, you learn from how not to do it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. If you go in and you know everyone's being really what I call jazz handsy, you know, being really big, you kind of go, oh. Yeah, you might want to make that make yeah. smaller. And you can, you know, and you do, you learn from other people as well, watching other people. Yeah. Everything you spoke about is exactly the problem we are trying to solve at I Am Pro. And I want to come with you on Saturday mornings to Meisner. That would be fun. Yeah, come, come. Where is it's it in really, London? Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, yeah. I, I'd, I'd never come across it before. So so with Stanislavski's method, it, it's very much to do, this is really simplistic, right? But it's very much to do with internal, you know, so, you know, you're really feeling it internally and it's coming out. So that's a method of acting, right? But yeah. Meisner's all about what you get from the other person and picking up, picking up from, from, from the person that you're working with. So it's, it's more external than it is internal. And neither is right or wrong. They're just different for yeah. different things. Um, and you might, the lovely thing about going to drum school or doing some class or going somewhere that gives you a new impetus, you can use that a lot. So in EastEnders, I used Laban technique quite a lot um, because um, because Mo was having such such a hard time in her life. She was she was ringing all the time. It's one of the Laban techniques is ringing. Um, yeah. And so internally, she had this internal ringing of herself the whole time. Um, and so I used that sometimes if I needed to. And I'd learned that at drama school, but equally you could learn that at a class. So I do think it's important to just look around, see what there is and continually develop. Do you have a particular process that you use every time? Um, I'd love you to talk us through um, from the moment you receive a script to how you then start building a character? So I think sometimes it's really um, easy to just look at your bits because you want yeah. to see how much you're doing and what, what the score is. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you don't want to, you know, you're not counting your lines, but you kind of are. Um, you want <laughs> to see where you fit in. But I think it's really important to just read the whole thing if you're allowed it. Because sometimes it, it, you're not allowed the whole script, which is, I think, bizarre. But um, if you're allowed to read the whole script, just to sit down calmly and read it as a story. Um, because it's really difficult to be objective if you just look at what you're doing. Um, and so seeing the whole picture, first of all. So the first thing I do is read the whole thing from beginning to end. And and this is part of your this is part of the process. You know, a lot of people don't understand how much actors do off of the off of the script or off of the piece you know you're you are constantly um, having to um hone what you're doing all the time so so first of all I do that so read the whole script get the whole thing see where think about where I, I come and also think about it a lot go for a walk and think about it because you can't create like that it's creativity doesn't come in an instant it comes when you're doing something else when you're um yeah. going for a bike ride or or on the jogger or whatever whatever you're doing washing up something monotonous something will occur so you just can't start thinking about it and start thinking how you would you would play that role 
Um, and then I for a screen, it's really important to learn everything so, so well. Um, I think on EastEnders, we were able to do a lot of jiggery-pokery with some of the lines because we, we'd been working there so long, we were very confident and comfortable. And I, that's different um, to when you're going in as a guest on something or when you're going in um, and it's new. So learning really it, back to front, inside out, learning it. And then you have to have a s section of openness because you don't know the person you're working with. If it, This is for screen. So it's different with theatre. But for screen, you don't know who, you, who you're going to be working with. You don't know how they work. Um, unless you know them as a as a as a uh, not, uh, or as a famous person, or you know their work, you don't know how they're going to behave or how they're going to react. So you have to have a degree of openness, and you get that from being very secure about your lines and everyone else's. I always learn their lines too, because otherwise, if you're just learning your cue line, you're not you're just listening out to that, and you're not actually listening to all the things that they're saying. So it's so boring learning lines and so annoying. Um, but it's really important to do it and to be tested on them. Um, so if you can get someone to read them with you, brilliant. And if they're terrible at reading, that's even better because sometimes yeah. you go, you're really listening to what they're saying because you're thinking, why, why, why are they not able to read that sentence well? But you think, oh, that's great, actually. Um, so um, Darren's really good because he reads like this, so it's really monotonous. And that's perfect for me because I, I am then really listening to what's being said because he puts no emotion behind it at all. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really good. Um, what you, The last thing you want is what my mother used to do was try and be everybody else. So she'd try and imitate people who are, who are doing lines with you. <laughs> oh, please don't do that. That's awful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you want somebody to be really blank and just read with you. But so you do the testing. So that's that. But in terms of character, gosh, you can go everywhere. You can go absolutely everywhere with it. Obviously, it starts with a lot of the time. It starts with how they look. But but if I if I talk about Mo her set, so so in creating little Mo right because um, yeah. she's one of the people obviously I've worked on so long. I did everything about her. So I did how she walked, how she constructed her sentences where she breathed, whether she breathed in her sentence or whether she didn't. Obviously, I had to um, do a lot of research on uh, people who were in domestic violence situations. So that was really important. It was important to do that. But a lot of and a lot of things that people said to me would then go into what, how I played her. So, for instance, she would stop in the middle of a sentence because she was always checking that the other person was OK about what she'd said. So she would say something, then stop, then say something. So she was quite staccato in the way she spoke because she, yeah. she needed to constantly check that situation, that she wasn't riling anybody, upsetting anybody, all of that kind of thing. So so it went, fr it went from, you know, what shoes are you going to wear to where you breathed in a sentence. And I think if you're playing somebody for a long period of time, it can do that. Um, sometimes parts feel very instinctive so you don't even need to think about any of that you don't need to think about you know uh, anything then other people other times you need to do all the research you need to especially if it's a period piece um what was going on then who was in political power then um how were people treated at that time um how did they walk how did they stand um, like so with Grantchester um, in the 1950s um, so people are much more contained there's not a lot of gesticulating so because that was considered kind of a bit frivolous and a bit uh, so everybody was so I don't gesticulate so much as as my character as I do as a person so there's that every every job is different and some jobs are so instinctive you won't need to do anything you need to just get up and speak the lines because it will be just all there inside you and other times you need to work harder can I talk to you about instincts for a minute because this is a conversation yeah. that is ongoing so a lot of people have said to me um over the years you, you're a really instinctive actress 
Now, when we act on instinct, is we act on our own instincts, but really we need to be acting on the character's instincts. You know, so I, I get, I suppose I'm sort of exploring this at the moment um, because I find it a bit confusing, you know, how much of ourselves we lend to something and how much is my immediate instinct and what, and, and actually sometimes I need to forget my own instinct because the character I'm playing would do something completely different to what Charlie would do. What What are your thoughts around that? Well, I think that when you're playing a character, and because I know you as an actress, um, when you're playing a character, you are being instinctively that character. I think that the choices you're making, you're already inhabiting it. You're already inside it. Um, you yeah. Know, you know, Janine's not you, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> when you're playing her and you're doing her stuff, you know, you're working from her point of view already. So it's already there. Mm. So I think, I think, the fact that you that people say you're an instinctive actor is obviously is a very big comp compliment because it means that you're alive, you're awake, you react to everything that goes on, um, and you react in the character way. And I think it's already there. I don't think you need to work. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to work so hard on on that. Um, the the only thing is is um, I think sometimes with with our instincts, and this is why you need a director, is that sometimes they can give you an alternative point of view yeah they can give you an alternative thought um and that might change it but that's what they're there to do as well yeah um i i think when you when you're doing something you don't have to think oh would the character do this i remember this was always the i think we, we're human beings we're playing people who do anything and who do anyone everything. can do it mm. yeah mm. so um i remember there were you know when i was training there would be lots of people who go i don't think my character would do this and i was like how do you know <laughs> Yeah, you don't know. They might do, because people do the mm. strangest things and people do predictable things. So, yeah, I think probably because you're already in it, you're probably making those choices from the character's point of view anyway. Mm. I love getting notes. I love working with directors who can just say one sort of thing and it will make you go, "Oh my god, I love that!" And then you have this whole opportunity to play with something completely different. Yeah. Yeah, but that's um, the joy of seeing talk... it outside. That's the joy of what of having a director who says, who says, yeah, I think that's great. But what about this? And it might not be mm. useful. It might, it might not be useful. It might be wrong, uh, and it might change something in a way that doesn't actually work with the piece. But that doesn't matter because that's what rehearsal is for, and that's what trying things out for, and that's what live theatre is for. It's all, it's all mm. for all the trying of everything. Do you have a preference, theatre or, or film, TV? Um, no, I don't. I really enjoy. So I'm just going to grab more. Water. Um, I really enjoy. I really enjoy both. Um, they're so completely different. I just think they're so different. Yeah. That it's yeah. and and each time you and I and I can't and I'm constantly learning on every job. It doesn't matter what what job I'm doing. I've learned I've learned something on every job. Um, you know, I've been on Grantchester for eight seasons now, and you know, I, I learn every time. I learn something mm. new every time. It's just, and and we're working with people, and it doesn't matter how old or young they are. I've learned brilliant stuff from young people, um, old lags from the business, you know, and also the yeah. other the other way around. You know, it's just brilliant to to be to be doing something that you that you've wanted to do all your life, and you're doing it. And and you're still learning it and still enjoying new things about it. Yeah, I'd hate it if do I you became ever... really, you know, um, I'd really hate it if I became like, oh, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just yeah, it's just a job. It's just uh, I, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't mean that to me. It means a lot. Yeah. Do, do you ever have or have you ever had? Um, just because at I am pro, we really try and you know look after people's well being and mental health and. Um, I know that I've definitely experienced a lot of self-doubt and imposter syndrome. Have you um, experienced that and how have you managed it? Yeah, yeah. And, and I've experienced the the stage fright. I've had stage fright um, and thought, you know, I can't go on. I can't do this. And um, yes, all of those things. I think I think it's important to obviously voice them um, and then 
all your fears, it's really important to voice them, to come up with them. Um, and I think rehearsal rooms are getting much better at that now. We used to have a, a, a you know, a phrase of, you know, the show must go on. And I've just worked with a brilliant stage manager who said that word, that, that group of words needs to be sponged from this industry. You are more important than this and your well-being mm. is more important than this. Um, so I think it, I think it is that you, you speak up about it, you try and get some help, whatever that, whatever, in whatever form that takes. Um, but you also push through it because that's mm. the only way it's going to get better is if you try and keep going, even if it's really small, if it's minimal, minimal, small things, small gains every single day, um, then, then just try those, try those things. But yeah, an imposter syndrome is, is always huge. Um, because especially if you have, um, if you're in something that, that everybody recognizes or people know, um, that, that then you think is, you know, is this going to be the sum total of my entire life and my career is going to be like in this one person or this one character and it is really difficult when you leave a soap you know the same thing for people to see you outside of that but if you've been successful in it um but you just keep pushing you just keep pushing the envelope you just keep trying new stuff you just keep saying you know i can also do this i can also do this you just keep throwing it out there yeah, I was I was going to ask you about that. Actually, I felt like I had a right to ask you about that since we're both kind of in the same position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does it bother you when people always go back to Little Mo case or not? I mean, it's it's because it was such no. a, a successful character. That's why they do, isn't it? But yeah, does it yeah. bother you ever? Yeah. No, not not now. Not now. I've got a body of work after it that has been really enjoyable yeah. and brilliant. Um, so yeah, no, not now. And also, you know. I just feel like it was just brilliant. You know, I loved, I love the fact that, that, you know, 20 years later, people are still talking about this, this person and still want to see her. Um, you know, and I love that. I think that's just ace. Um, and you know, it was hard, it was hard graft at the time. Um, but I'm really proud of the stuff that I did in that. Um, and I'm glad to say that now. Um, Mm. I, I understand why, you're constantly linked back. But it's interesting, I think, that it's very particular to EastEnders itself. Um, there are there are certain actresses who've come out of um of other soaps um who don't get tagged with that all the time. Um I always mm. say, you know, if if I ever won an Oscar, the t- the headline would be Little Mosca. <laughs> it wouldn't be <laughs> It wouldn't be me, um, but I I'm happy with that. Made peace with that. Um, mm. I've I've really have because I, within the industry, people give me lovely opportunities to do other things. Yeah. So I you know it's just it's just difficult when you first leave. It's hard um, because you get offered the same roles all the time. So you have to turn a lot down because if you continue to play that character then that is all you will be seen in. And I have had people mm. say to me, Case, you should stay in your lane, you know, just, just, you know, get in this groove and stay and do that kind of character all the time. And you go, that's not what I became an actor for. So mm. it's about personal choice. That's fine if you want to do that. That's, you know, knock yourselves out. But um, but it's not something that I want to do. So you've got to yeah. do your own personal journey, really. Yeah. And one last question, because I'm aware of time and I could talk to you for ages and ages and ages. But um, what advice would you have for anybody younger or older? Because we've got a lot of pe- older people on I Am Pro looking to revisiting their dreams of, you know, becoming actors. What advice would you have for those people? God, there's so much, isn't there? Uh, because, again, like you're saying, imposter syndrome, how can I give people advice? You know, <laughs> who am I to give people advice? Um I think about all the <laughs> yeah you know who am I to say that to say you should do this or you should do that um I think understand how how difficult it is and don't compare yourself to anybody else it it I learned that at drama school I think I've said it before that I I've got I look a bit like Patricia Hodge and 
um, I went into my drama teacher and said to him, um, I'm going to do an old cow word for my, um, for my showcase because um, I look like Patricia Hodge and she does loads of an old cow word and blah, blah, blah. And I gave him this whole speech about why I should do an old cow word. And he's, he just said one sentence. He said, you're not the second coming of Patricia Hodge. You're the first you. <laughs> and I was I like, ah, oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think be the first you is one of there's the overriding thing. Whatever you bring. So say say you and me, Charlie, we were cast, we did the same thing, we were cast as in the same role. You would play it differently to how I would play it. Um mm. and that's good. That's brilliant. Mm. Because you bring what you bring and I bring what I bring. So understand that what you're bringing to it is unique, is is good is your it as long as it's you, you uniquely yourself um and you you won't you won't fail in that instance and i don't mean you've got to play yourself i just mean what you bring to it so your you, your methods your style your that your influences all of that what you bring to it um will be so uniquely different to anybody else how anybody else can play it so just be the first you and what a brilliant way to end this Q&A with Casey Ainsworth. That was great advice. Honestly, thank you. <laughs> no, oh God, every, every bit was gold. Honestly, it was fantastic. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you um, on I Am Pro. So thank you for joining me. Well, it was so lovely. And, and you, you have to come to Meisner with me. We both can go because I don't really know much about it. So I would love to do it. We will go. The it's work in is London. ongoing. Yeah. The work is always ongoing. Always. Always. Yeah. Thank you, darling. I'm sending you so much love. There's my love.